Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through this Bible. So today, <laughs> we are in Jude, and it's day 309. So, I hope you're doing well, hope you're walking. There is so much going on right now in life. So much going on, and, um, and I hope that you're taking time to get in the Word. I was just taking a minute. There's so many calls on our time, and uh, I have the same in my life. And it exceeds my ability to serve. And I'm sure it does to you as well. And, and I'm not saying that, uh, that there isn't personal time scheduled in there in my life. There is. Uh, but there's also not maybe enough personal time. Um, I don't know. But there's a lot of needs in this world. And I know that we're small small tiny vessels that can only be filled up with and poured out with so much so uh was just taking a minute to reflect on that um, it feels as though there's less time now than there ever has been and um i don't know why that is it might just be the holidays you know events that are scheduled you know we have obligations ourselves uh, at this time of year, um, both at work and with friends and family, and those are all great. Um, and then just the normal moving life forward stuff. So I was just taking a minute to not let those things overwhelm me, to take a deep breath, to give them to the Lord when one thing or the other frustrated me just to know, Lord, sorry don't want to be mad about that just give it back to god and we got to right we got to so have a sip of coffee whatever beverage you're enjoying and why don't we stop and why don't we pray lord we love you god thank you for giving us uh, lives to live and to love with and lord we're all trying to find with that with that um i always want to say the word balance but you aren't a god of balance <laughs> not not really god of pouring out sacrifice of giving and loving and um although you do balance and hold the universe together um god we just want to give you all the all the people and all the things that we're trying to do give you our family the ones we love this time of year and just ask god that you fill them with your spirit god you fill them with your love your patience your kindness your goodness your gentleness all the fruits of the spirit may you open up our hearts and our minds to understand what you got to say through jude god this book is some mystery in it and um, some very straightforward matter of fact stuff lord we just pray god you just help us understand help me understand lord lord we love you we pray for your your people and pray for peace in jerusalem lord it's in your name we pray jesus amen all right so we are in the book of Jude, and we are in the last letter right before Revelation. And um, wow, what a journey it's been, right? So Jude is a single page in most Bibles, unless uh, you're reading a Bible that just keeps kind of rolling over page by page and doesn't allow for gaps, start and beginnings. Um, so uh, this book should be able to be accomplished today we'll see we'll see my intention is we're going to open up with the greeting and then we'll read the main body of the letter which is in two parts we'll take it part by part and then we'll read um, the uh, final greetings or as <laughs> as it's listed in Jude, a doxology which is a final blessing so all right so why don't we pick it up in jude chapter one verse 1. 
Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. What a blessing, you're right. <laughs> what if we opened all of our text messages that way? All of our emails. You know, I used to, when I was uh, first in my first months as being a believer, and I was just spending so much time in the Word, I, I did used to write my emails in a similar fashion. You know, Zachary, uh, bond servant of Jesus Christ and, and a brother in the Lord to so-and-so who's called and beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then write the body of the email. Obviously not for work, but, you know, to a friend or somebody, right? And um, I'm sure it just sounded so odd. I did have a el older brother in the Lord, um, a friend's uncle, who had been walking with the Lord for a number of years. And he, uh, he was just struck that I and his nephew and some of our friends would communicate in that way. It just blew him away. He was like, wow. Like, you literally converse in a biblical tone, in a cadence. And uh, it, it didn't strike him as odd, whereas I think most people it did, right? It's just, it does. I mean, it would probably strike me as odd now. It, it'd seem odd. Why are you writing in this way? other than to be cute or, you know, make a point. And, but to him, he was just so, like, biblically pleased. He loved the Word of God. And he just loved to hear, you know, all of us in our late teens and early 20s, in love with Jesus, writing back and forth to one another in these, you know, uh, phrasings, right? So, but I'll tell you what, that is a way to pray for people. Any one of these greetings, man, any one of these greetings is a prayer, is a way. So, you know, you get your final greetings, in this case, a doxology, and, uh, you know, they, you know, pray that so-and-so and to the glory be God, and, you know, there's plenty there to wrap up a letter and and be thankful for you know sort of the format of language that you could pray but these greetings you know i'd be lord i'm your servant jesus and my brother or sister who you've called who's beloved in you god the father and he's kept for you jesus God, please, may mercy, may your peace, and may your love be multiplied upon them. Amen. Amen. May it be multiplied on you. May peace, mercy, and love be multiplied on you. May you be kept for Jesus Christ. May you be beloved in God our Father. Amen, right? <laughs> it's a good word. All right, well, why don't we pick it up in verse three. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Straight away. 
Jude is acknowledging that people have infiltrated the church, that they did so from long ago, and they did so to pervert the grace of God. That is his unmerited gift towards us in his sacrifice. That is his forgiveness for our sins. And they take that mercy, that, that grace, and they pervert it. They twist it so that they can do all the sensual sins that they want. They're forgiven. Oh, the Lord forgave me. Oh, I keep messing up, but God loves me. It's my journey. <laughs> it's my authentic journey. Uh, so people can use language and use the grace of God as a cover for their desires and designs to commit acts that actually don't represent God. Now you might look at your life and see ways in which you're doing that. I don't know what they are, you do. And you can always find more dirt <laughs> if you dig into your soul. There's always more corruption. <laughs> God is always cleaning us up day by day, moment by moment, bit by bit. But I, I want to remind you that Jude is talking about these larger issues. We're talking about people that literally have a mission that are infiltrating your church to act in this way. Now, this is a nightmare for any leadership group in the church because this letter would imply that it's your job to root them out. And you should deal with sin in the church. But this is not a blank slate for you to write out your manifesto on cleaning up the church. Because people act in a way that you don't approve of. And so for leaders then, leaders need to take responsibility for their congregations and set a standard of behavior that is acceptable and not acceptable. And that's not even to say that it's setting standards of salvation because people can take the rules of engagement of how we are going to gather and how we are going to hang out with one another and what's okay and what's not okay and then make those the rules just like the Pharisees did adding laws upon the law and make that the standard of salvation make that the standard of fellowship make that the stel the standard by which you're uh, <clears throat> connected to the body of Christ and that's not what they are but there are basics, like some churches are like, look, don't wear a hat. Like I teach the Bible <laughs> almost always with a hat on. A lot of times I'm outside, I'm sitting out here and uh, I throw on a hat. And uh, you now in some churches, they'd be like, you know, you shouldn't cover your head. Why are you doing that? Let alone, my goodness teaching the Bible with a hat on church I go to as a pastor has dreads down to his rear end and he's a happy hippie pastor and uh, that guy gets letters and argued with all the time throughout his entire life about how you know why do you have long hair dude well, what's up with that so these are just things that you wear, let alone the way in which you engage. There are some churches that'd be like, hey, never as a man or a woman, never be alone 
with somebody of the opposite gender in a situation which, though you may not sin, that hanging out time might be perceived as committing an act of sin. And therefore, you don't want to bring that upon the church. So don't do it. In general, I would say, if you want to honor the Lord and you don't want to find yourself, you know, taking each other's clothes off and you're really into each other, you probably shouldn't be alone <laughs> until you're married. Um, I know that my wife and I, we hung out, we watched movies. We definitely kissed before we were married and, and all that. And uh, the temptation was there, obviously, when you're young. Um, but I would say that your church may say, look, you can't be in good standing if you present this act or this appearance of sensuality because they're trying to guard against this, right? They're trying to make sure that people don't creep in and find it okay to hang out, right? So it's, it's really hard. I'm not saying this is easy. But with tact, with grace, gracious speech, I think we can broach these subjects, right? And none of us are judges over one another. The Lord is. I don't judge the servant of another. Jesus said that. It's not my job. But if I see a situation and I might ask, little more information and if the opportunity is there I might talk about it in broader terms to see if that stirs up some level of understanding or conviction and often it does right often it does don't get me wrong I would feel offended too if somebody got into my life and was like hey let me nitpick the things that you do that they don't think that I should do right where I feel like I have a lifetime of foundation of, of knowing my Bible and what I think it says and how I should behave, right? So I'm totally there. I would totally feel like that if somebody had a problem with me uh, driving uh, single women, uh, women who work in the sex trade or are strippers from strip clubs or work, you know, hanging out at bars or whatever, right? I'm trying to give you an example. And my job is to drive them. And they're like, you shouldn't do that. You should just turn down the rides. Well, that makes up about 50% of my job <laughs> at night. Well, then you shouldn't drive at night. Okay, what, what should I do? Tell me what job I should have. And do you have that job, right? <laughs> And then they go into that job and they're like, okay, no, don't do this and don't talk to that person and don't hang out here. And you start to realize that every job in the world has its own pitfalls, its own sins, right? So when we're trying to abide in a passage like this. So let's bring it back. And clearly this is going to be a two message series at least because we are not going to get through all of Jude today. But these people have snuck in with the designs. Jude believes with intentions. And their intentions are to subvert the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and corrupt the church. And I believe that that is possible in today's church, for sure. I think that there are those who get a kick out of stuff like that. I don't know that there, there's no organizational conspiracy to do it, right? But I think people get a wild hair and they may be going with the intention of, you know, just kind of going and mocking, doing it on for whatever reason, or maybe that they did walk somewhat close to the Lord for a little bit, but then somebody did them wrong and then they're just like yeah let's screw with this it's totally possible 
or there are people that just come to have a looser moral understanding of the Bible and they don't agree with a stricter interpretation of this. And so their behavior then coincides with this subversive nature that Jude's talking about, which I have a stricter interpretation of. So it's interesting. It's tough. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully, fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Three, three or four examples, well, is that three? Jesus with the people of Egypt. We have the angels, eternal chains. Yeah, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Three examples. Um, isn't that interesting? Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you read that story, and we're going to in the new year, Lord willing, right? Uh, never mentions Jesus by name and mentions the pillar of fire and cloud by day, right? And Jude ascribes that, assigns that identity to Jesus, that God Almighty in, in the person of Jesus, his, his personal expression, came and led the people of Egypt out. That's amazing. That's an insight that um, is an example of prophetic understanding that was floating around the church um, at the time uh, that got written down here in this letter. There are so many other truths that are true that we don't have confirmation on nor do we have description of that are true nonetheless like this that's fascinating to me um there is going to be an unfolding of truth and a story of what has happened and who was who and what was what that will probably take an eternity to read or to hear and it's tidbits like this that are fascinating he talks about the angels who didn't stay in their proper position of authority but left their proper dwelling he's kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day and you're like holy cow there is a group of angels that rebelled and they are essentially in a cell waiting for their judgment which will come at the end of day the, the great day of judgment and does that include all fallen angels does that include all I don't think so because we have other examples of people writing about um, the prince of the power of air and demonic forces and all of this right so i believe that there are not all the angels that are contained here in this judgment or that are being held for judgment but that's my read on it and then you have sodom and gomorrah who are engaging in a sexual lifestyle that our modern society seems to approve of and they did as well but the bible writes that they were judged and um, i had one time many years ago was attending a, a, a retreat and um one of the 
speakers had a ministry down in a West Coast city that was known for this sort of lewd behavior. And if that's your, your lifestyle, hey, here's the bug. Everybody's got to wrestle with what it says. And that's a way in which if that's your inclination, if that's your sexual desire, then that's what you got to wrestle with. Um, for some people, it's, you know, other things like don't steal. And you're like, my entire soul, everything in my being wants to work out a scheme to take things, you know, and they have to resist that. They have to fight that. So like, there's a whole range of things in us that want to express themselves externally that the Bible's like, hey, don't do that. that. That's not who I am, says the Lord. So, but in Sodom and Gomorrah, likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of, ex of eternal fire. And this person at this retreat was teaching out of a psalm that referenced that period of time that talked about a lack of uh, compassion and it's a very obscure verse and they they created this whole justification of why god actually punished sodom and gomorrah that had nothing to do with one the main body of text right in the old testament and two this passage here and others right in the new testament they clearly reference why the Lord judged that area and those people and made it about how people were uncompassionate and not giving, that they didn't help the poor. Created this whole social theology around this one obscure verse. And yet you have a passage here which is so blatant and in our face. And I guess that's a good word to know whether it be issues around sensuality as Jude brings up here with false teachers who are trying to weasel their way in. And then the church has to figure out like, how do we keep that from happening? And Lord, how do we, how do we help our brothers and sisters who maybe have a standard of righteousness that's a little bit different than mine or whatever? How do we deal with injustice and sin in the body as a whole in these grander scales? Yet in a like manner, these people who are relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are the hidden reefs, at your love feast as they feast without fear shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by winds fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever it was also about these that enoch the seventh son from adam prophesied saying behold the lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him these are grumblers malcontents following their own sinful de desires they are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. So I preview that and just say, we're going to come back to it. There's just so much there. And 
maybe I'll give a concluding thought here about Jude in general. Jude opens up our eyes to things which are not corroborated anywhere else. Jude speaks with authority. This is what Enoch said. This is where the fallen angels went. This is without any doubt what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities and why. And he uses very visual language to describe the deceptive nature of those that are seeking to corrupt the godly in the church. So I think we need to spend another day on Jude for sure. All right. Well, hey, till tomorrow, day 310. We'll hopefully, Lord willing, wrap up Jude. Till then, keep walking, all right? God bless you. Bye-bye.